How do you make a great looking cutout display like one of these for your front yard, even if you don't have any artistic ability? Stick around. I'm John Bryant and I'll show you how to make it fun. If you want to read about how I made Superman, I wrote an article for Planet Christmas that I'll link to. About six or seven years ago, I discovered a product called Coroplast, and that's what I'm going to be using for my demonstration. Coroplast is a name brand, but basically, it's corrugated plastic. It's just like corrugated cardboard that's used for making cardboard boxes. The advantages for using Coroplast is that it's lightweight, it's easy to work with, and water doesn't bother it whatsoever. There are plywoods that are specifically made to be used outdoors, but they're a lot heavier and a lot more expensive. In this video, I'm going to be showing you how to make a Christmas cutout, but don't let that limit you to just Christmas displays. You can make cutouts for Halloween, for Easter, 4th of July, Thanksgiving, birthdays, whatever you want to make them for. Just like with any painting project, the first thing you've got to do is take care of the prep work. With Coroplast, once you get it home, you need to clean the surface. I use a product called Naphtha that I get at the local big box store. You could probably also use paint thinner, possibly rubbing alcohol. Uh, just about any degreaser uh, will probably work on the surface to get the oily residue off the Coroplast. I do want to caution you to properly dispose of whatever rag you're using, especially if you're using Naphtha or paint thinner they can spontaneously combust if you just wad them up and throw them in the trash can. Now, I know the easy thing to do is to bypass the prep work, but you do not want to do that. I made that mistake one time and paid for it. The uh, paint bubbled up on the Coroplast and pretty much ruined the project. When I'm cleaning off the surface of the Coroplast, I simply take my naphtha, pour a bit of it on the surface, take my rag, and wipe it off. One of the great things about using naphtha is that it dries quickly and you're ready for the next step. The next step may seem a little bit odd, but you definitely don't want to skip it. You want to prime your Coroplast with a coat of exterior flat latex white paint. Now, it may seem odd to be priming your Coroplast with white primer since it's already white anyway, but there are a couple of reasons uh, for doing this. The first reason is that the primer will help your color paint to adhere better to the plastic surface. The second reason is that when you go to draw your image on the Coroplast, pencil doesn't show up too well on plastic. If you paint it white and then you go to draw on it, it's going to show up just fine. We've finally gotten the prep work out of the way, so it's time to get the image put onto the Coroplast. As promised, I told you that you could do this without being a great artist. There are several ways that you can draw your image onto the Coroplast. I'm going to cover three of them. The first one is if you have natural artistic ability. Fortunately, I do have that ability, and I used to draw out all my characters freehand, but that takes a lot of time to do, and I don't do it that way anymore. The second method is to use the grid method. Now, my purpose here isn't to give you instructions on how to use the grid method, so I'll let you look that up on YouTube and find out how to do that, if that's the way you want to go. The third method, and the way that I use, I cheat. I find the characters that I want to draw on the internet. There are a couple of different ways of projecting the image onto the Coroplast, so you just trace it. If you happen to have a digital projector, you can hook up your laptop to the projector and project the image from your digital projector onto the Coroplast in the same way that I use an overhead projector. I print the images out onto the transparency. I take the transparency, put it onto the overhead projector, and project the image onto the uh, Coroplast. 
After you get uh, the image projected onto the chloroplast in the proper scale, simply take a pencil and trace over all the lines that make up the character. Pretty easy to do. Again, you don't have to be an artist to do this. As you can see, I've got uh, my chloroplast up against the wall, and I've got the image of Mary and Joseph projected up there in the uh, appropriate scale that I want it to be. If you're wondering how I've got the uh, chloroplast held against the wall, I set up a series of four clamps on each side of the chloroplast uh, that screw into the wall and hold the chloroplast to the wall. Now, I don't expect you to do that. You can simply take some duct tape and put a few pieces of duct tape along the side. That's going to hold the chloroplast in place. So now that I've got everything in place, all I have to do is take my pencil and trace over my lines. After you've drawn your uh, pencil outline, you want to take a step back and look at your drawing to make sure that you've got all the pencil lines on there. Because once you move your projected image, it's really difficult to get it lined back up again. So I've gotten the tracing process done, and I've taken the chloroplast down off of the wall and put it on my workbenches because it's a lot easier for me to work on here than it is for me to work on the wall. The next thing that I need to do is to take a black magic marker and go over all of my pencil lines. I finished going over the pencil marks with my permanent magic marker and I wanted to point out one thing. Uh, I'm not sure if you'll be able to see it or not, but I have created a base with the pencil mark coming straight up about seven inches uh, on this side and on that side. And that's where I'm going to uh, make my cut for the bottom portion of the cutout. Now the reason I do this is so that I have one solid piece down here at the bottom and I try to make each of the characters look the same. Another thing I want you to notice is that uh, I have made a pencil outline edge coming up through here, going around the staff, connecting to the head, and coming back down. And these areas I will paint a really dark gray so that they just get washed out in the background at nighttime when the floodlights are on. Now the reason I do this is so that I have a solid piece going all the way through here and I don't have a flimsy little cutout if I were to cut this piece out and this piece out. Uh, this whole arm and the uh, rod that he's holding would be a little bit flimsy and could bend when the wind is blowing. Cutting the figure out isn't the most fun part of the process, but it is one of the most exciting because you get to see your character take shape. There are a couple of ways to go about doing this. I used to put blocks of 2x4s on the floor. I would lay my chloroplast on top of that. Then I would take my jigsaw and cut out. As I've gotten older, I don't like to bend over that much. So the way I've set it up now is I have two benches that I work with and I place my chloroplast so that I can make my cut in the space in between the two benches. So the first cut I'm going to make is to get rid of uh, all of the excess up at the top. In my jigsaw I've got a fine tooth metal cutting blade. I've found that the uh, metal cutting blade gives me about the smoothest cut that I can possibly get in the chloroplast. I'm going to put on my uh, ear protection. I want to make sure that I've got it spaced properly so that I'm not cutting into my workbenches. I'm ready to make my cut. Now 
Now that I've got the excess cut out of the way, it's just a matter of going around the exterior lines of my cutout and finishing cutting. We've got our character drawn, we've got it cut out, and now we need to make a frame for it. The frame not only gives you support for the coroplast, but it gives you a way to stake out your display pieces in the front yard. I use one and a half by one and a half pressure treated lumber to make my frames. What I do in order to save a little bit of money is to buy 2x4 pressure treated or 2x6 pressure treated lumber, bring it home, and cut it down to 1.5 by 1.5 on my table saw. To get started on making the frame, you want to keep one thing in mind. It doesn't have to be pretty. It just needs to be fairly stable in order to give your coroplast some stability. The first thing that I do when I'm making a frame for one of my characters is I take the character and turn it face down onto the table. I'll then take a piece of the pressure treated lumber and I'll line it up at the bottom and fairly close, maybe a half an inch in from this edge, I'll come to the other edge and put a mark on there. It doesn't have to be perfect, but you wanna make it in from the edge a little bit so that it can't be seen from the front when it is standing up. So I'm going to make my cut on the miter saw and then we'll start uh, assembling the rest of the pieces. As you can see, I've made the cut to the base piece and I've placed it on the back side of the uh, character and I've positioned it approximately where it's supposed to be. So the next thing I want to do is start building upwards and try to build a rectangular type frame. So I'm just going to set my next piece of one and a half by one and a half on there. Again, I want to make sure that it is in from the edge so that it can't be seen from the front when you're looking at the character. I'm going to come up here to the top and just make a mark uh, to where I want to cut it off. As you can see, I went ahead and cut all of the vertical pieces for my frame. The next thing that I need to do is to take measurements and cut two more pieces to fit between each of the three vertical frame pieces. I've got all the pieces cut for my frame and as you can see I've uh, laid them out on the back side of the coroplast so that you can see what it looks like. When you're building a frame you want to try to cover as much of the surface area as you can so that you don't have a lot of flimsy edges around your character. When I'm assembling the frame I use two and a half inch decking screws and I make simple butt joints. I found that the butt joints work just fine through the years and I haven't had any trouble with it. If I'm working on a large piece, I'll usually add in a little bit of support in the corners. I'll take a piece of the lumber and I'll cut it with a 45 degree angle on both ends. Once I've gotten that taken care of, I'll place it in the corner, then I'll attach it to both pieces using two and a half inch exterior screws. In this case, this piece is so small, I don't need to add in the extra support. One thing you want to make sure that you do is pre-drill your holes. If you don't pre-drill your screw holes, you're probably going to end up splitting out your lumber. So let's get started. I've gotten the frame completely assembled and now it's time to attach the coroplast character to the frame itself. What I'm going to be using to attach the coroplast to the frame is a one and a quarter inch decking screw and a quarter inch washer. Once I've flipped it over, I want to align the bottom edge of the coroplast character to the bottom of the wooden frame. I want to make sure that it is aligned properly, so I've got a little gap on each side here. And then I want to check along the edges to make sure that nothing is showing. 
Once I've gotten the character aligned properly on the frame, I just take one of my screws with the washers and screw it right through the coroplast into the frame. If I over tighten it and crush the coroplast a little bit, I just back it off and the coroplast pops right back out. All I have to do now is attach the coroplast to the frame by using more screws and washers. You want to try to put your screws in places where you'll be able to paint over them and not have to draw over it with your magic marker. So I'm going to attach uh, probably five, six, seven more screws and we'll have it done. I've got all the screws put in place, so now the coroplast is firmly attached to the frame. I've got my arsenal of brushes, I've got my paint, and I'm ready to start painting. The paint that I use is an exterior latex flat paint. It's important that you use a flat paint when you're painting your characters. If you use any kind of paint that has a sheen to it at all, when you have the light shining on it at night, it just reflects the light and it makes it really difficult to see the character. The paint brushes that I use aren't really special, uh, but I do have a lot of them because I don't like to stop in between every color and have to wash my paint brush out. So let's get to painting. I finished up with my first coat of paint, but there are a few things I wanted to point out to you before I get started on my second coat. I wanted you to notice that you can see that the screw heads with the washers pretty much disappear once you paint over them. The second thing I wanted to point out is that the dark gray areas that I've painted in for the background pretty much fade out and you don't really notice them that much when you're looking at the entire character itself and it's even more so once you put them outside in the nighttime with floodlights showing on them. The last thing that I wanted to point out is that I've painted directly over all of the magic marker lines on the interiors of both of the characters. It makes painting a lot faster and you're still able to see the lines. The one thing that you want to keep in mind is that if some of your paint is going to cover up the marker lines completely on the second coat, you want to take your magic marker and go over those lines before you apply your second coat. That way it assures you you'll be able to see your lines after you put on your second coat of paint. So that's what's coming up next. Magic marker and second coat of paint. Painting is now complete and you need to take your magic marker and go over the lines one more time. Now you could consider that your project is complete. It looks okay, it looks done, but there's one more thing you could do to make it even better. I like to add a little bit of shading to my projects. Adding shading to your characters gives them a little bit more dimension and really makes them pop. To do my shading, I take some black paint and really thin it out with a lot of water. I also do the same thing with brown paint. The brown paint I use on all the skin tones and the black paint I use on all the other colors. 
What I try to do is imagine where a light source would be and then do my shading on the opposite side of where the light would be coming from. I use a really stiff brush and dip that into my watered down black or brown paint. Keep in mind as you're doing your shading that it's not going to be perfect, but it doesn't have to be perfect. We've gotten the character drawn, cut out, framed up, and painted. The last thing I need to do is show you how to get it staked up in your yard so that you can display it. One of the easiest ways of doing this is by using some pressure treated stakes. If you'll notice, I've wrapped a little bit of electrical tape around the top edge of the stake so that it won't split out. On the other end, I cut it into a point that makes it a little bit easier to drive into the ground. Obviously, I've turned the piece around so that you can see how I stake it up. The first thing that you're going to want to do is lay out all of your separate pieces for this particular scene so that you know approximately where you want them to go. After you get all your pieces lined up, you want to take one of your stakes and drive it into the ground approximately lined up with one of your vertical uprights in your frame. You want to drive the stake in so that it's far enough that it's going to be solid but not too far so that you can't get it out later on. After you get the first stake driven into the ground, you want to take your second stake and line it up so that you'll know you'll be able to drive it into the ground and still be able to put a screw through the stake and into the frame of your piece. So I'm going to move the piece to the side and drive the stake a little bit into the ground. After you've driven the stakes into the ground, you're going to want to drill pilot holes for all of your screws. In this case, we're going to be drilling four holes and placing four screws into the piece. Obviously, if I were really putting these pieces up uh, for my display, I'd drive these stakes deeper into the ground, but this is for demo purposes. I've drilled my pilot holes, so I'm going to take my two inch exterior screws, drill through the stake and right into the frame. Again, if I were really putting this out for my display, I would drill my pilot holes in this stake and then put my screws in to hold it in place. Once you've gotten the screws through the stakes and into the frame, your piece should be secure for the season you've got it sitting out. Thanks for joining me as I showed you how to create a cutout display piece for your front yard. I've made a tips and tricks video to go along with this one that gives you a few more details on how to go about making your own coroplast cutout for your front yard. You can access that video by clicking on the link in the lower right hand corner. If you found this video to be helpful, please like, comment, and subscribe. Thank you.